Hi everyone and welcome to another video by BioTeach, this time a video focusing on Required Practical 3 on the A-Level Biology course as well as the BTEC Applied Science Units 3, 5 and 6. Unit 3 looks at various experiments so something like this could come up in theory. Unit 5 has cell membranes as part of it and osmosis or transport across membranes so water potential is something that you need to know a fair deal about. And finally Unit 6 which is the investigative project where you might need to research water potential of tissues. So this experiment is looking at how we can determine the water potential of potato tuber cells. You will prepare and use various dilutions of sucrose solutions. Some method sheets look at using sodium chloride solution or salt solution, but for years I've used sucrose with really good results. We use potato because they're really easy and cheap to obtain, and we can also cut and weigh them very easily. They also have a fair amount of water in their cells without being overly soggy, so to speak. And so we can carry out this experiment with a fair bit of ease. This experiment can be changed to allow more freedom to select variables. So for example, I use sucrose, but you could use salt solutions. The students or teachers may look at various sizes of potato chips, assess how long to soak them in solution, things like that. Okay, so let's get on to the method. The first thing that you need to do is label six boiling tubes, 0 0.0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 and 1.0. These numbers and labels represent the respective concentrations of sucrose you will be adding to these tubes. In those tubes, you will make 20 centimetre cubed volume of sucrose solution. You will already have a beaker of 1.0 molar concentration of sucrose, so you can use that to make your various dilutions. We don't actually use a serial dilution in this method because the concentrations are so close together, so you will literally just have to work out the amounts of water to put into each of those tubes and the amount of sucrose solution to top it up with, or the other way around, whichever way you're working. So the best way to do this is to draw a table like this in your books. You can see that on the top row we have the concentration going from 0, 0.0 to 1.0. The second row is the volume of sucrose solution and the last row is the volume of water. Note that each of these titles of the table have the units with them. So you've got to be careful about including these units in. So it's really easy to know how much to put in the first and the last tubes. To make a 0, 0.0 concentration of sucrose, you simply just need to add 20 centimetres cubed of water, no sucrose solution at all. And for the 1.0 concentration, you just need 20 centimetres cubed of sucrose and no water at all to dilute it. So that's simple enough so far. To make the 0 0.2 concentration, we simply need to add 4 cm3 of sucrose and 16 cm3 of water. The way that I've worked this out is to use the B1C1 equals B2C2 formula as shown on the screen. So my volume 1 would be the volume that I need, so that's 20. My concentration 1 is the concentration that I need, which is 0 0.2. And I put that as a formula, which is equals to volume 2, which is what I'm trying to work out, multiplied by the concentration of the sucrose that I've got. So when I rearrange that using algebra and work it out, I will get V2 equals 4 centimetres cubed. And if I'm putting 4 centimetres cubed of the sucrose solution in that tube, then I need to top that up with 16 centimetres cubed of water. So hopefully that makes a bit of sense. If you need to pause the video and kind of write it down to understand it a bit better, then feel free to do that at this point. So similarly, to make the 0.4 concentration, we simply need to add 8 centimetres cubed of sucrose and 12 centimetres cubed of water. You can see the calculation for this on screen too. To make the 0.6 concentration, we need to add 12 centimetres cubed of sucrose and 4 centimetres cubed of water. And the calculation for that is also on screen. And then finally, to make the 0.8 concentration, we need to add 16 centimetres cubed of sucrose and 4 centimetres cubed of water, and the calculation for this is also shown for you. I would like to add that the colours that you see going from cream to browny yellow on the test tubes are just there to illustrate that there's a dilution happening here. Sucrose is not a coloured solution, but I've used them here just to illustrate the point of diluted going to more concentrated, so hopefully that just gives you a visual. 
You should also try to have some practice using the V1C1 formula, as you'll encounter this several times in biology, mainly in chemistry though, but I think it is good practice to know how to work this out. The next point is to put the boiling tubes with the sucrose solution in a water bath at 30 degrees. We use the temperature of 30 as it's fairly neutral temperature to work with. Remember that temperature affects the rate of reaction, so if we pick 30 degrees, it's easy to control at this stage without it being too quick. I mean, you probably don't want to cook your potato, so try not to nudge the hot plate over 30 degrees. I should also state some tips here. Let's say that you do get the water too hot when you're looking at the water bath, the easiest and quickest way to cool it down is to pour some of the water out of the beaker and then add in some cold tap water. Some people tend to use ice chips, but that sometimes takes a while longer for it to cool down. Just bear in mind that tap water is usually around 20 degrees. Now, whilst the tubes are in a water bath, you can prep your potatoes. You can use a cork borer size four to make cylinders of potato, which are about two centimeters in length. Ensure that there's no peel on the potato as you want to ensure that all surfaces are going to be in contact with the sucrose solution. The cylinders or the chips that you've created from the previous step will need to be blotted with a paper towel and you can do this simply by rolling it on the towel. Dabbing the ends will make sure that they're dry as well. It's really important to do this gently and not to squeeze the potato as you don't want to remove the water from the inside of the cells nor do you want to break the cylinders. And once you've dried them, you need to put them in a quite neat fashion on a paper towel, which is labelled the same way as a boiling tube. So this is probably going to be quite useful for you to visualise. So if you grab a paper towel and kind of split it up into sections, I normally get my students to draw uh, a line down on the paper towel and place each cylinder in its own place on the towel and label with the various concentrations that you're using. You will have a set of weighing scales, so each cylinder will be weighed separately and the mass will be noted on a suitable table, which I'll show you in a second. The next step after you've weighed each potato cylinder is to transfer each of them from the paper into its own boiling tube with the same number. Be careful when doing this so that you don't get them mixed up. So do them one by one. So you'd put the 0.0 into the 0, 0.0 tube or the one that's just got the water in the 0.2 into the 0.2 tube, 0.4 into 0.4, and so on and so forth until all of your cylinders are in their respective boiling tubes. And then you need to pop your tubes back into the water bath and leave them in there for 20 minutes. Now, whilst you're waiting for your 20 minutes to pass by, you can spend some time creating a lovely table in your lab books. You can see here that I've the independent variable on the left hand side. Remember that you recorded your initial mass before putting the potato into the sucrose? Well, that can go into the third column. I've put the final mass in the second column as it makes the maths easier, as we will be subtracting these two to obtain the process data. We have the change in mass column second from last, which is labelled as final minus initial. And note that the last column is the percentage change in mass. Also note that all of these columns have the units in place, so be careful about this because if you don't have the units in place, you could lose marks in your lab book or the exam. So once the 20 minutes have passed, you have to remove the cylinders from the boiling tubes and ensure they go back on your labelled paper towel in the correct box. So the one from the 0.0 will go on the 0.0 slot on the paper towel and so on. The cylinders will need to be blotted dry and not squeezed, and then they'll all need to be reweighed separately. The final mass for each cylinder can be recorded on the table that you've drawn in your lab book, and we can plot a graph from the processed results. So let's just have a look at the table in a bit more detail. Here, I've got some example data which might help you if you either didn't do this experiment or you somehow messed up the experiment. Feel free to pause the video and write these values down so you can use them for your own revision. Now, in this table, we have the initial mass and the final mass. We can see that all of the cylinders are not identical in mass to begin with, despite being the same size in length and diameter. This is because different parts of the potato will have different contents of water and starch, so each cylinder was never going to be the same. Because you don't have the same starting mass, you have to process this data to calculate a percentage change in mass so we can actually compare each cylinder with the other in terms of concentration of sucrose that they were immersed in and in terms of the final mass. 
So the first thing we need to do is calculate the difference between the final and the initial. And we do this by simple subtraction. You can see how it helps to have the final before the initial column so that you can actually work out the math easily. So I've got the values here. For the first one, we've got a difference of 0.27 grams. The second one, I've got a difference of 0.06. Now for the third onwards, so from 0.4 concentration onwards, we've got minus numbers. And if you look at the figures, we can see that in these cylinders, when they were in higher concentrations of sucrose, actually they lost mass. So in what we're looking for in terms of the science is that water has left the cylinder and that's why they've lost mass. So these minus numbers are there because the mass has been lost. So don't be daunted by the minus numbers. I usually ask my students why the final mass was lower and they're quick to add that water has left the potato cells by osmosis. Some students are a bit averse to minus numbers and when they appear they think they've made a mistake in their calculations but worry not if you follow this particular method you'll be fine with the calculations. The last calculations we need to do are the percentage change in mass. So the formula for this is on screen now, where I've written down that it's the final minus the initial divided by the initial multiplied by 100. Now, you've already worked out what the final minus initial is. If you look at the second to last column, that's the difference between the final and the initial. And so you simply need to, for each one, divide the final minus the initial divided by the initial mass and multiply that by 100. So for the first one, for 0, 0.0 concentration, we've got the percentage change in mass as 4.13. And then we go down, and as we reach 0 0.4, you see that the percentage change in mass is negative. Effectively, what we're saying here is that they've lost mass, and the percentage mass is also negative. Once this table is completed, you're ready to draw a graph. You will be plotting concentration against percentage change. As concentration is your independent variable, it will go on the x axis and the percentage change will go on the y axis. I should point out that you've got minus numbers on the y axis, so the zero on your x axis will be kind of a third or midway on your graph paper to allow you to plot your graph, so just be careful about that. Your completed graph will look something a bit like this. You can see that the x-axis is about a quarter of the way down from the top and there are minus numbers on the y-axis. You can also see that purple circle highlighting where the graph crosses the x-axis. There should be a level of understanding at this stage of the experiment about what's happening at this particular point. Where the graph crosses the x-axis is where there is no net change in mass. This concentration of sucrose solution has the same water potential as the cytoplasm on the potato. That is to say that the potato is in an isotonic condition at this concentration. Water cannot move in any direction as the concentrations both inside the potato and outside the potato are the same. A lot of students have trouble grasping this concept, but hopefully seeing the graph and revising the osmosis topic might help you. I always ask my students to complete an analysis of the graph. Essentially, what I'm asking them to do is do a describe and explain type task, which is something you will know comes up quite a lot in exam papers. I want them to tell me what does it look like and tell me why does it look like that? And what I advise them to do is split the graph as much as they can. So I would advise you split this up into three portions. You've got the first part, which is above the zero on the x-axis, and this is where there's been a positive percentage change. You've got the second part, which I've just talked about, which is part B, where the graph crosses the x-axis. And then you've got the third part, where there is a negative change or negative percentage change in mass. This allows you to understand which bits to talk about so that you don't waffle on for ages, and also so that you don't miss the key parts. On the right, you can see the bank of keywords that I'd be looking for in their analysis and their lab books. So if we look at part A, I would expect students to talk about how the greatest mass is gained at 0, 0.0 concentration or water only. And I want them to say why this has happened in terms of water potential and the type of solution that the cylinder was in. So I'd be looking for them to talk about whether it was hypertonic or hypotonic. For part B, I already mentioned in the previous part of the video where I said it's isotonic. So here I'd want them to talk about how there's no net movement of water. And for part C, I'd be looking for a mention of a loss of mass and therefore water from the potato cells has left. 
and an explanation in terms of water potential and the type of solution. So I hope that makes sense guys, I really hope that, that was useful for you and easy to follow and to watch. I know that lots of you are enjoying these videos particularly about practical so thank you so much for your comments and your feedback and your likes and the messages that you send me on Instagram. Please make sure that you leave me any comments or any feedback that you've got or any questions that you might have underneath this video. Thanks so much for watching, bye for now.